Vodka must be radioactive. In fact, any drinking alcohol, that's a rule in America. There is no explicit rule for Germany, but what is the reason behind this rule? The alcohol for drinking is described by the chemical formula C2H5OH. It is a carbon containing molecule and it can contain radioactivity in the form of cosmogenically generated carbon-14 isotopes. Normally the carbon in C2H5OH is the carbon-12 isotope. About 1% also contains the carbon-13 which enables the analysis through NMR and in tiny amounts in the order of 10 to the power of minus 10% carbon-14 is present. This carbon-14 is radioactive. It's a beta minus emitter with a half-life of 5700 years. So when the alcohol is fermented from plants, the carbon-14 was previously present in plant sugar C6H12O6 and is subsequently contained in the C2H5OH ethanol. However, there is also the possibility that ethanol can be produced from petroleum. And since petroleum is older than 57,000 years, any carbon-14 that was once present has decayed. This means that a carbon-14 content in alcohol is a direct evidence that it was obtained from plant fermentation. We can detect this carbon-14 with a liquid scintillation counter, as the device can detect betas with an efficiency of up to 100% and carbon-14 is a beta emitter. The great thing about this device is, unlike gammas in the Geli, we do not have background noise and it also has this fantastic high efficiency, which is necessary because we are dealing with activities below one decay per second here. Now on to the experimental part. We need vodka, laboratory ethanol, washing benzene and a suitable scintillation cocktail. In this vials, 12 ml of the ULLT scintillation cocktail were added. In addition to that, either 4 ml of vodka, 4 ml of water or 4 ml of laboratory ethanol previously diluted to 37.5% or 4 ml of benzene. As an additional background measurement for benzene, another vial with 60 ml of just this scintillation cocktail was added. Each sample was measured for exactly 3 hours after standing in the closed device for the first two hours. This is called tray delay. Now I can directly answer why tray delay is so important. A measurement in the LSE only works if a particle decays, excite a solvent molecule and this excited solvent molecule then collides with a scintillator molecule, transferring its energy to it. The scintillator then emits this excess in energy in the form of light, which can be measured as a signal. However, the scintillator can also be excited simply by light and then fluoresce. No matter how weak this fluorescence is, it would distort our measurement results. So we have to wait until this light induced excitation subsides and the scintillator is only excited indirectly by this radioactive decay in our sample. Before we look at which sample contained carbon-14, I should bring you all on the same level explaining where the carbon-14 comes from and how it gets in the alcohol. Carbon-14 is created high in the atmosphere through cosmic irradiation. Cosmic radiation primarily consists of protons, high energy photons and alphas. Neutrons are not stable enough to survive the long journey from the sun to our earth. So for example, one proton can break down oxygen atom resulting in, for instance, three protons, a neutron, a helium-3 and beryllium-10 to be formed. Just as an example, the reality is way more chaotic. This neutron can then, through an NP reaction with the nitrogen, form carbon-14 out of the nitrogen. This carbon-14 can then, for example, spread in the atmosphere as carbon-14 containing CO2. For now on, I will only refer to plants, although this applies to every living organism. But usually we do not obtain our alcohol from animals. The carbon-14 content in plants is kept constant through CO2. If the plant dies, carbon-14 can only decay and is not absorbed through photosynthesis in the form of new carbon-14 containing CO2. The plant binds all carbon in the form of sugar according to this strongly simplified reaction. And alcohol can be obtained from this plant by fermentation. The alcohol can then bind this possibly still radioactive carbon in a new form, the ethanol molecule. So now the results. Here we can see the vodka example in blue and the background in darkish. We clearly have radioactive material in the vodka and judging by the position of the peak on the x-axis, 
This can only come from carbon-14 with a better energy of a maximum 156 kilo electron volts and an average of 50 kilo electron volts. Here's the vodka overlaid with the laboratory ethanol sample and we know that the laboratory ethanol in our labs is produced from renewable resources. If it was made from petroleum, the spectrum would look like this. This is the spectrum of benzene along with the background measurement and as we can see, we can't see anything. No carbon-14 in benzene because this is washing benzene which was produced from petroleum. Isn't that cool? In the future, the question will arise whether we can detect carbon-14 in E10 fuel from the gas station and whether it can also be used to authenticate old wines or pre-war whiskies, but that's only for the distant future. A special thanks goes to the working group of analytics and fundamental nuclear chemistry from Dr. Eric Strupp and the division of nuclear chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, goodbye.